the Chuitna River. No place for a coal strip mine. We named our group the Chuitna Citizens Coalition, or as we call it, the CCC. We started it to bring awareness and to educate people about the proposed Chuitna coal mine. The Chuitna Citizens Coalition has produced this program to illustrate the terrible downside risk of the proposed Chuitna coal project. You'll hear from Alaskans that would be affected by the killing of a wild salmon river. The Chuitna River. No place for a coal strip mine. As outside mining corporations try to exploit Alaska's resources, conflicts between mining and salmon conservation have escalated. In Bristol Bay, it's Pebble, but only 45 miles west of Anchorage, it's the proposed Pack Rim Coal Strip Mine. This strip mine site would be 15 miles from Tionic and Beluga, but the coal corridor and the industrial coal port would completely transform the land use and directly impact local Alaskans. The location of the industrial shipping port and its storage piles of coal along with direct air and water pollution would be concentrated between Tionic and Beluga and directly impact about 15 miles of the Chuitna River. I'm a fisheries biologist, I've been a fisheries research biologist, I've worked in fish culture, uh, I've done uh, research on habitat related things, and I also was regional supervisor. I worked for the Department for Fish and Game for 32 years, and uh, I was responsible for reviewing projects affecting salmon habitat and refuge, state game refuges, critical habitats, and sanctuaries. And in that uh, capacity, I my region reviewed literally tens of thousands of mining projects, large and small projects, uh, in that whole area, including the Chuitna, the proposed Chuitna coal mine back in the 80s, uh, when they proposed to go with it and then sort of dropped it. You know. But I'll say we've learned a tremendous amount since those days about the feasibility of restoring salmon habitat. You know, one of the things you have to understand is that uh, the state uh, really is very kind of ill-prepared to deal with projects of this type because it requires specialists like Margaret Palmer who have spent their whole life working on this. Not somebody that has to review a thousand projects a year, I mean 500, a thousand projects a year, everything ranging from, you know, culverts under streams to, you know, large mines. And you cannot, these are very specialized projects with specialized sets of knowledge and it's not taught in college. and you know, the people with the state, particularly the Department of Fish and Game was concerned as fish, just doesn't have that information, you know. Lance Trasky recently testified before an Alaska Senate committee on the Chuitna Project, along with Dr. Margaret Palmer, professor at the University of Maryland. Dr. Palmer told the senators, there's no evidence that the reclamation of streams and wetlands at the Chuitna site is feasible at any cost. I don't think it's possible. There's no, no, no question about it. I mean, they remove one entire tributary, I think it's stream 2003, the whole drainage down to a depth of 300 feet. The whole thing, all, it would be all gone. And including parts of two other major salmon producing tributaries, those streams would be gone. There, there wouldn't be anything left there. There, you know, so. So, so there's never been any type of reclamation attempted or successful along these lines? No, uh, no. In fact, I've I spent many years working on this sort of thing, including fishing game, but after fishing game I got into it really intensively. And I've talked to experts all over the country and some of them all over the world. I've researched all the scientific literature and there is no instance where anybody has strip mined a salmon producing drainage and then rebuild a salmon stream on top of it. It's I would say it's almost impossible. I mean, because what you see on the salmon stream on the surface is only a small part of what's going on. What's really critical in the salmon stream up here is the what they call the hyperreic flow, which is the flow through the, the stream bottom, 
and also what they call the phreatic groundwater, which is coming in on the sides and upwelling in the stream. And this is important for a couple of reasons. One of them is that's where salmon like to spawn, where they have this water to aerate the eggs. So, but the most critical thing is during the winter, because up here, during the winter, there is nothing but groundwater flow. But once, once you destroy that whole aquifer, you remove it all. You know, that shallow aquifer that's feeding that stream, there's nothing to feed it. You can build something on that looks like a stream on top of it, but it's really just a ditch. Now, if you're in Missouri, you, catfish might live in it, or smallmouth bass or something, but salmon would, couldn't survive in it up here. Well, what, what we've learned now in recent years, and like I say, we've learned a tremendous amount since this mine was per proposed, and even recently, two things really drive these salmon streams up here. Because, you know, this really isn't very productive country. I mean, if, you, if you're from Kansas or Missouri, you know how many deer there are per square mile down there and everything else. You know, there's like 40,000 moose in the whole state of Alaska, something like that. You know, <laughs> so... It isn't very productive, but what drives these systems is the marine drive nutrients, which is what the salmon bring in. All these, they go out as little fry, they come back as big fish, and the ones that make it up there, they die, and all that nutrients from that salmon, it's like manure, they rot, and it's in the perfect uh, formulation to provide new fish. So that stuff builds up over the years, and it's not only in the stream, but it's in the, it's in the uh, vegetation and stuff because it's carried off by... So you've got this whole titer of nutrients build up over the years, it's like the prairie got thicker and thicker. Well, these streams have gotten more and more productive because of that. The other thing that drives them is uh, um, nutrients from wetlands. And you've been over there, you know how wet that is. The whole thing is a big wetland. So all that stuff, that vegetation, it takes, you know, that oxygen and nitrogen and carbon dioxide and makes essentially food for that stream and then it decays and washes down in the stream. Once you remove all those wetlands, and this will, they'll be gone, and you remove all the marine drive nutrients because you've taken the stream and the whole drainage, it's, it's depauperate. There's nothing, there's nothing there to feed that stream anymore. Now, you, you can say, well, maybe you come in and fertilize it or rebuild wetlands. People haven't been very successful building, rebuilding wetlands on that kind of scale. Even, it's been difficult because we've tried it to build small wetlands. It's been very difficult to be successful, but not... 8,000 acres or 12,000 acres, is, which is what they would have to do. I mean, it's an incredible task. I mean, they're taking this mountain valley, digging it down to 300 feet, removing all the stuff, dumping it back in the hole, you know, and all that structure and those layers and stuff, all gone, it's all mixed up, and then building a stream on top of it. I mean, to the uninformed, it may seem, well, you know, you just build a, you could line it with concrete or something, the water run down, you know. Wouldn't work for salmon. It, there, it's a very, very complex situation. I think there's literally hundreds of thousands of streams in Alaska. I mean, literally hundreds of thousands of streams. But there's only something like 20,000 that actually support salmon. And that's because they have all these characteristics that make it successful. And the other ones don't. I, and I share that opinion. There's nothing anywhere to indicate that, that this would be successful. If you tried it, you might have to redo it a bunch of times to try to get it to work, and it would make the mine, and there's no guarantee of success even then, but it would make the mine economic, uneconomical. They couldn't, you know, couldn't afford to do it. Because you'd ha you have to construct these shallow aquifers, and all this stuff is settling at the same time, and the stream is cutting, and it's just, you know, God laid it down that way, and you're not going to be able to put it back that way. It's, 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 like, it's like the sending of a mission to Mars, only maybe even more difficult, because you don't have the money to do it. I mean, you can't justify it. We local Alaskans have a major choice to make in developing our resources. Should we maintain and support our renewable wild salmon and the untainted environment they need to thrive in? Or should we choose short-term gains and allow industrial strip mining to directly mine through the streams that are critical to their survival? Is it even possible to restore a system of wetlands and streams to pre-mining conditions? My name is Ward Grant, and I know this area intimately. In the 1940s, my father, Frank Grant, first settled in the Beluga area on the west side of Cook Inlet. His new family soon followed. 
1950, Dad purchased fishing sites on Three Mile Beach. It is the very beach that Packroom wishes to place its energy port for offloading the coal harvested from the Shewitna strip mine. To dig up to 400 feet in any dry area, like Montana or Kansas, there would remain a sterile area that looks like this old mine site in southeast Kansas. However, to dig up to 400 feet deep in Alaska bogs, wetlands, and salmon streams has a completely different outcome because of all the water displaced by that size of a pit. Now, I'm one of the few summer residents that's actually set foot in the proposed mine area. It's an area 20 miles beyond the end of the road system here. And uh, I used to go up there and guard people that were doing survey work in the mine area, some people doing drilling samples and uh, water and plant sampling. And uh, it's such a wild area up there, they didn't want to send the crews up uh, without having an armed guard with them. And so we'd ride in with helicopters each day, and uh, I'd stand by with uh, all the necessary safety equipment to make sure that uh, the survey people could get their job done without being worrying, worrying about uh, large animals. It's uh, about uh, 1,500 feet altitude above sea level, and the best way to describe it is it's a swamp, a series of interconnecting swamps that filters the snow melt uh, that comes from the Alaska Range up where Mount Spur is. And uh, it's part of nature's way of filtering that snow melt into the river valleys uh, to where the rivers come out just about crystal clear. The proposal is to take about a six square mile area and excavate it down about 400 feet. Now it's already swampy to start with and these swamps are interconnecting heading toward the sea, all of them. There's no way you can build a pit that big without diverting the water that it gathers somewhere else. This is going to end up in the Chuitna River and that's going to change the flow of the river, it's going to change the volume of the river, it's going to change the pH and I don't care how many containment ponds you put together to try to keep it back if uh, there's a great big flood, if there's a major earthquake, or a volcanic eruption, there's very little man can do to hold back that kind of water. And the consequences are very, very poor for the Chuitna River and for the beach just outside the Chuitna River. Commercial fishing and sport fishing has just about finished up for the season. Uh, the dories have been parked and uh, getting ready for uh, the opener uh, next summer. But the decisions that are made in the very near future could really, really affect this way of life for both commercial fishing interest and the sport fishing interest in this area. Now neither group are particularly against industrial development or natural resource development. We all have a really high opinion of the other industries that are currently operating in the area that don't harm the environment. We're not against industrial development because we share this area already with a power plant, Chugach Electric, from NSTAR, a major pipeline distributor of the gas that's produced in this area, and Chevron and ConocoPhillips are all active producers and very good neighbors here on West Cook Inlet. And uh, we really think that uh, the coal development in this area is counterproductive to the natural resources that uh, we're developing here, which include salmon out of Cook Inlet and salmon out of the rivers Silver salmon! And it's a jumper! <laughs> oh, yeah! That's a really nice one there. <laughs> this is a beautiful fish. The Jewett River, as seen here, winds its way toward Cook Inlet flowing freely for 25 miles from its headwaters at the base of the Alaska Range. Its spawning holes and numerous tributaries are home to all five species of wild salmon. Here we can see Chewett River King Salmon paired up and spawning instinctively as they have here since time began. That's mating there. That's, yep, mating and egg laying right there. This spawning area is just downstream from Middle Creek, the tributary that would carry the coal mine waste. Chewett kings are already threatened, 
and with this proposed coal mine, the king salmon haven't got much of a chance. We're not the only ones depending on food from the Chewett. The river valley and the beach is also home to Alaska's coastal brown bears. These bears and birds have depended on migrating salmon more years than I can count. Alaska has some unique wildlife that can't be reproduced just anywhere. Reclaiming a dead salmon stream isn't like restocking other fish into a pond. Salmon's unique life cycle requires pristine spawning grounds just like the Chewett. Reclaiming a dead salmon river is a much bigger task than spreading around topsoil over the scars left on the land. Dirty coal for Asia at the expense of our salmon and way of life? I don't think so. And I hope you agree. We think it's important to keep the Chewett wild. Walking these banks between the natural resting pools needs to be preserved for future generations. I guarantee that any sport fisherman that ventures way out here loves nature and hopes they're not the last generation of people to enjoy the Chewett the way it was. Pretty rough day, and we're here on the right on the beach. And what we're trying to do is get both the lead line and the float line up over the front of the boat of the dory. And Terry's got the floats. Casey's got the lead line. And we're going to run this clear out to the buoy uh, to get an idea what's in this net. The tinder boat has arrived to pick up our catch. <coughs> So uh, we want to make one final pull here, get the fresh salmon out of the net, and uh, off to the tender boat, to the processor, and on to market. This is a gill net, <clears throat> and the fish swim into it and get their gills caught in it. Terry's picking them out, pulling a gill so they're bled and iced before going to the uh, market boat. Some days when you're out here doing this, it's real calm, other days gets a little more interesting. It's a pretty tough job being on a moving boat like this. It's pretty slick. Handling fish and pulling nets. It's a lot of work. Here's a nice, nice silver. Very nice. Okay, here's a bigger one. This is a male silver and you can see the the hook nose. This one's certainly a male. This one's a female just because of the straight jawline on it. And this one's probably full of, full of eggs and was headed for the river when it hit this net. Now it's headed for the supermarket. This is a red salmon or a sockeye. And um, I believe some of these are four or five year fish when they come back this size. This is in the seven plus pound range. And uh, this is one of uh, the Alaskans' favorite fish for the dinner table, red salmon or sockeyes. This one's headed for the grill. The Cook Inlet commercial salmon catch amounts to $55 million a year. This employs hundreds of fishermen, transporters, processors, and retailers through careful management of salmon, Alaska's most precious renewable natural resource. We observe the state's management rules to make sure salmon stocks remain strong and are never overfished. These net fishing openings are restricted to either one or two 12-hour periods per week during the short salmon harvest season. The commercial fishermen share this beach uh, with the existing industry that's uh, going on here. Uh, the same beach where we launch our dories is right where they bring in the industrial barges with truckloads of uh, equipment to rework the wells and the uh, power plant uh, materials that uh, can really come in no other way. But the partnership includes uh, uh, some really good cooperation. 
Uh, these landings are never scheduled on fishing days and it's only done at high tide where the barge landing is carefully prepared for each landing. The barge comes in and offloads really tractor trailer loads of uh, equipment and supplies and then gets out before the tide goes out. All this needs to be coordinated and certainly is here on uh, West Cook Inlet. Pack Rim wishes to place its coal delivery trestle over the top of our commercial fishing sites and place a large man-made island in front of these sites and all the remaining sites on Three Mile Beach. This construction will alter the natural flow of water and sediment and migration of salmon along the beach. This negative impact to our fishery is coupled with the overall health hazards of coal dust and noise pollution that will become part of our lives and the lives of our fellow residents. Three generations of my family have lived and worked these very productive fishing sites. We understand that although there are many challenges and at times risks that come with this lifestyle, the rewards are great. It takes a way of a way of life that I've known my entire life. And a good part of our income too. It's a lifestyle that it's the only way I know how to live. When I first discovered Pack Rim's plan to directly mine salmon streams and dump millions of gallons of wastewater to the Chewett River, I couldn't believe it. Placing an energy port directly in front of our set nets will destroy our fishery. Millions of tons of coal piled near the inlet will create direct pollution of our beaches and our waters and the air that we breathe. I am glad that neighbors have joined together to form the Chewitna Citizens Coalition because if permitted, this project will produce noise, water, and air pollution that will harm the entire Chewitna Valley. And these effects will not be limited to fishermen, but will diminish the lives of all the local residents on both sides of the river. Need all the help we can get to stop this mine. This is a bad, bad deal. And we're just trying to bring awareness to this coal mine and try to defeat it. The salmon use the whole river for spawning. It's amazing. I went up there with Fish and Game and we've walked a little bit. And, uh, you know, when, when they go up with a helicopter to, to count the fish, uh, it's amazing. Just just above the high tide mark, uh, and all the way up the river, they they utilize the river to uh, to spawn. Now, Middle Middle Creek, the one that they want to eliminate, uh, produces uh, right around on the average of 20 percent of the silver salmon in the entire Chua River. 20%, that's a, that's a lot of fish. Behind this proposed coal strip mine site is an active volcano range with two seismic faults that run north and south. Both are right near the mine site. What I've witnessed with the volcanoes heat up, there are hot spots in the wetlands and surrounding lakes. The same action is what keeps the creek water from freezing as the warm groundwater comes up through the earth and into the rivers and stream beds, it supports our salmon fry year round. These are just a few of the things that concern us and would like to see this project stopped instead of killing more of our salmon. Nobody, that, unassociated scientists that have worked in this all their lives all say it can't be done. It hasn't been done, it can't be done. And there's I, I put together some reports on this. There's a ton of information in there. It's all backed up by citations, scientific literature, and experts. You know, demonstrating that it hasn't been done and that in, very improbable that like, nobody anybody be successful. Uh, the mitigate. There, what they'll do is what the state will probably do if they get the opportunity is to approve this mine, mine with mitigation, and their mitigation will be well. They'll have to reconstruct the salmon stream. Even though everybody else says it can't be done, they will uh, they'll say, well, we'll reproduce the runs. We'll build spawning channels like they do in Canada uh, and, and rearing ponds. But I don't think that'll work. Uh, cooking and aquaculture, I think, tried 
maybe more than 10 of these spawning channels, and they all failed over time. Now, they've done this in Cook Inlet. They did it in the past. It didn't work, and you can check with them on that. I think one of my big concerns is that there's now pike and that you went in the drainage. And any time you create a pond or slow water with lots of little fish in it, they're going to clean them out. And they, they, won't, they won't go up into these tributaries that like 2002, 2003, because the water's real fast. But they will go in at something like a spawning channel or a rearing pond. So it's kind of futile. I mean, we've had problems with them here. They've wiped, the pike have wiped out all the salmon, you know, in Red Shirt Lake and a lot of those lakes in the valley. And the only thing that saves the streams, and a lot of the streams that are still working, is the pike, it's unsuitable habitat for them until we create suitable habitat for them, you know. Um, the other big thing is this, is all the stuff that they've proposed for mitigation, you know, all the things, you know, artificial streams and, you know, doing all this stuff. This has all been developed in the Pacific Northwest in Canada, you know, the rearing channels and all that stuff. They developed it because the runs have dwindled to almost nothing, okay. If they actually worked, they would do it down there. They would do all this stuff and they'd have great salmon runs again. But they spent billions and billions of dollars trying it. It didn't work. So why would it work here? Why would anybody believe that it would work here? My father, who lived in 97, would never have called himself a conservationist, but he was one. He loved Alaska and understood that although he took from nature every year, a balance was needed. He held to the belief that if you overexploit the resources that nature provides, wild salmon in this case, you pay a terrible price. It is about looking toward the future with a careful eye behind you to make sure nature can regenerate. If you don't, there'll be nothing left for the next generation of our family and the families in the area. The Shewitna Coal Project flies in the face of my father's philosophy, but that hardly diminishes his wisdom. I have listened to the Pack Rim Company representatives, the state officials who support their effort, and those that want more development of Alaska's resources. My response, and I believe my father would agree, is that development is inevitable, and if correctly done, all benefits. Unfortunately, the Shewitna Coal Project makes development synonymous with total destruction. They do not seem to understand that reclamation is not the same as restoration. They only have an eye to the future and quick profits. Despite what is promised, there is no looking back by this project to a regeneration of nature. The unbiased, peer-reviewed science that has been presented shows this clearly. In summation, the Shewitna Coal Project is a very bad idea. More than just the physical changes to the watershed, we're also worried about the health aspects of living next to a coal strip mine. During every step of the strip mining project, coal dust will be carried by the winds. That includes digging, hauling, grinding, transporting coal chips on the conveyor to the stockpiles near the beach, and then to the artificial island at Lad Landing, later to be loaded on ships two miles out in, into Cook Inlet. The whole area, including the beach, duck flats, and nearby commercial set nut fishing sites will be black. Pollutants from coal adversely affect all major organs of the body and contribute to four of the five leading causes of death in the United States. Coal dust causes diseases of the lungs, including chronic bronchitis, emphysema, pneumonia, and black lung. Current medical studies also show that it causes heart disease, premature death, and many types of cancer. I don't understand how our government agencies can justify destroying this area's people, salmon, wildlife, clean water, and air just to enrich outsiders by mining through salmon streams and shipping dirty coal to China. Hope you enjoyed the video. Here's what you can do to help save this and other healthy wild Alaska salmon streams. Go to our website at www org. There you'll find a link to Governor Parnell. Write to him and demand that he keep his promise to not trade one resource for another. Don't trade away our wild salmon to dig coal to ship to and support China's economy with the loss of ours. Send letters to the editors of local newspapers to help us get the word out. Our wild salmon can last forever if Pack Rim doesn't mine through and destroy their habitat. Thank you for watching, and remember that it's not too late to make a difference. 
join us and let your voice be heard.